Good to go. Okay, well, first of all, let me welcome everybody to the South Florida Business Council. This is our uh, webinar we're hosting, and uh, this month we have an extremely exciting speaker. Uh, exciting speaker in more of the ways than one. He is the incoming speaker of the Florida House and could not be more uh, pleased that he was able to join us today with his very busy schedule. So as you come on, we'll spend a minute or two making sure everybody gets in and we populate the webinar, but uh, want to thank you all for joining us. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule, taking a little time away from this COVID-19 pandemic as we all focus on bringing Florida back uh, even better than ever. So uh, please uh, continue to get up to speed here in terms of the webinar. Make sure your sound's working fine. Make sure your video's working fine. As we're doing this, let me give a couple quick thank yous. Uh, first of all, thank you to uh, Tony Cortez uh, for helping us out, lining up the incoming speaker. Tony is a gentleman I've known for two decades, outstanding uh, member in both government and politics up in Tallahassee. And uh, I know the speaker's pleased to have him stay with him on his staff because he's first class. I also want to thank the Chamber of Commerce of the Palm Beaches, uh, Dennis Grady. Uh, just great job as always with this and thank you for your leadership. Of course, the Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce with Alfred Sanchez and his members. Uh, thank you, Alfred, for uh, joining us and for all the work you do. And then Dan Lindblade with the Greater Fort Lauderdale Chamber of Commerce. Uh, again, with these three leaders at the chambers, fantastic uh, leadership and uh, great results as we all deal with some tough times. Also want to recognize Christine Barney, the immediate past chair of the South Florida Business Council and uh, someone that is involved with everything from the chamber to uh, the different alliances, to even helping out with the national championship football game. What an incredible uh, young woman she has been and what an incredible asset. And then today you'll hear from Joe Chase. He's with Gunster Law Firm, uh, one of uh, George Lemieux's law partners, Senator Lemieux's law partners. And Joe's gonna be introducing our issues to the incoming speaker. So uh, Joe Chase, thank you. And then Joe will be chair of the South Florida Business Council next year. Uh, I believe we're pretty much populated in terms of who's joining us. I know we've got uh, well over 250 people joining us on this webinar, but let me uh, just formally start with a welcome to everybody for today's seminar on the business impact of the next legislative session in Tallahassee. I'm Jack Seiler with the law firm of Seiler, Sauter, Zayden, Rhymes, and Walbrink, and I'm honored to be chair of the South Florida Business Council. On behalf of our board of directors and our cabinet members, we thank you for being part of this important session to hear directly from the next speaker of the Florida House of Representatives, the Honorable Chris Browse. You will have an opportunity to ask questions throughout the webinar by using the Q&A function on the platform. We'll keep track of those questions and our team will bring those questions uh, forward. And if we have time, we'll get, a, we'll get the answers to those questions from the incoming speaker. This webinar is intended for the private use of the South Florida Business Council and its affiliated organizations. This session is being recorded and is for the express and private use of the South Florida Business Council. Any rebroadcast without the South Florida Business Council's permission is strictly prohibited. Now we wanna let you know what you told us leading in today's webinar. Upon registration, we asked you for questions and we're gonna review your responses. Uh, the first question was, how did you spend your Labor Day holiday? Obviously an issue that's impacting all of us in terms of the tourism and economic activity here in the state. And you see there that 81% of us stayed at home. So uh, we wanna see those numbers trend more highly where people travel uh, in Florida, travel around Florida, and let's support, support Florida business, Florida hotels, Florida restaurants, and Florida tourism. So you see the numbers there though, that 81% stayed home. Hopefully you did get out and support our South Florida restaurants and businesses. Uh, the next question we asked, is what do you believe is a top issue facing the state of Florida right now? And I'd be interesting to hear from uh, Representative Sprouls when he gets a chance to speak as to how this issue probably plays out statewide. But if you look at it here in South Florida among the three counties, and I should have mentioned this at the start, the South Florida Business Council represents uh, thousands of businesses among the three chambers and probably hundreds of thousands of employees when you think about all the businesses that are involved in our three chambers. But here you've got uh, the top issue by and, by and far away was COVID-19 at 64%. The next big issue was a state budget. So um, 
and I don't believe that the state budget's immune from the COVID-19 and vice versa. So that's, that's another interesting uh, discussion to have today. And the third question we had, uh, when do you believe our economy will be back to pre-COVID-19 conditions? Again, um, a lot of anxiety on this, a lot of people looking forward and you see the numbers there. Uh, no overwhelming clear favorite there, but uh, we're looking out further than I think we thought we'd be looking out in terms of this recovery. But I know everybody involved in the business community and South Florida Business Council is looking for a full economic, social, and health recovery. Uh, do we have one more question there, Mike? Okay, those are the three questions. Let me do this. Uh, at this point in time, let me introduce our chair-elect, Joe Chase, from the Gunster Law Firm, to review of a, key of our, uh, a few of our key priorities. And then when he's finished, we're going to go to the speaker and, and get his priorities. So, uh, Joe, take it away. Great. Thanks, Jack. Welcome, Representative Sprouls. We created the South Florida Business Council to address the big issues that impact our region's economy, which, as many of you know, is the 12th largest economy in the United States. Our watch list issues are mobility and transportation, water management, tourism growth, affordable housing, education quality, and recently added, for obvious reasons, COVID-19. You can find more in-depth information at www.soflowbusinesscouncil.com or just Google South Florida Business Council. Clearly the economic impact of COVID-19 has been devastating for the world. Specifically in South Florida, we have been hardest hit in the areas of tourism and hospitality and also housing. Our unemployment rate has jumped from under 3% to over 10%. After the Great Recession, tourism was our economic recovery driver. This sector has been particularly hard hit by COVID, which is why continued full funding and a permanent extension of Visit Florida are critical to our recovery. As for housing affordability, we know it is merely a matter of time before rent and mortgage forbearance is over. Renters, landlords, and homeowners face evictions and foreclosures in the near future without further assistance from federal, state, and local government. That is why we, we request immediate action and that the 225 million in the Sadowski Trust Fund for the SHIP program be immediately distributed to counties to address COVID-related housing concerns, such as rent and mortgage assistance. We have many other issues and positions. However, these two items are paramount to not only South Florida, but the entire Sunshine State. I wanna thank you for your consideration moving forward, Representative Sprouls. We look forward to your leadership in 2021. Jack, back to you. Thank you, Joe. And uh, Speaker Sprouls, I think you're gonna hear that a lot of your priorities are probably our priorities. I know you've been uh, very, very closely aligned with the business community, but at this point in time, let me just give you a quick background on Representative Sprouls. He represents the Palm Harbor and Pinellas County area in the Florida House of Representatives. He is in line to become Speaker of the Florida House in November of 2020. During his uh, very successful tenure in the Florida House, he led efforts to change the laws in Florida on issues ranging from education reform, to DNA privacy protection, to criminal justice transparency. He has worked to expand school choice. He's a strong advocate for our veterans, and he works hard to protect American communities. He practices law in Tampa with the prestigious national law firm of Buchanan Ingersoll Rooney, and he previously served as a gang and homicide prosecutor in the state attorney's office for Florida's sixth judicial circuit. Graduated from the University of South Florida, undergrad and then Stetson University College of Law. He and his wife Shannon live in North Pinellas County with their two boys, Prescott and Conrad. And Chris will now share his viewpoints and priorities. And then when he's finished, we'll move through a few uh, conversations and questions and answers. But Speaker Sprouls, honored to have you here today. It's a privilege for the South Florida Business Council you, to welcome you, give you a chance to get some exposure to the businesses here in South Florida. Please proceed. Well, thank you, Jack, and, and thank you, Joe, and all of you, uh, the Business Council and all your affiliates for having me with you today. Uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, you know, Joe made a comment about, you know, kind of coming into COVID and, and uh, talking about priorities for the state. You mentioned that you know, your priorities are, are my priorities. The reality is, you know, in a, in a post-COVID world, um, there's only Floridian uh, priorities. You know, we come in, you know, you would, if you would have asked me a year ago, Jack, about, hey, what are you thinking for, you know, the first session, um, you know, that you have the opportunity to be speaker? And, and as they say, you know, 
um, make a plan and God laughs. Um, well, that's, that's true, right? I mean, and here we go into COVID um, and all the things that you know and the issues that we're having. I want to start a little bit before we hit COVID. You know, so as you go in before, you know, the last legislative session and towards the end of the legislative session, what did Florida look like um, from a national perspective? Because I think as we talk about the situation that we're in and where we're headed in the future, it's very important to realize where we were just a few months ago. You know, just a few months ago, as we're into the legislative session, you know, we could look at, you know, we could look at our financial reserves, billions of dollars, three or $4 billion um, in reserves, a very healthy reserve fund. Um, during my designation of, uh, last year in September, you know, I mentioned wanting to, you know, continue to put more money into reserve um, as a way not just to maintain our AAA bond rating, which is important for us nationally and internationally as we, as we build and expand our, our, our roadways and our corridors, um, but also, you know, just to having a healthy future. I even talked about, um, this is pre-COVID, talked about having a disaster preparedness fund here in Florida. As you know, Jack, being in the legislature um, and then in city government, you know, we, we're, we're, act, we're, we're, you know we're, we're prone here in Florida, whether it's in hurricanes, of course, now we can add pad pandemics to the portfolio, um, that we're going to experience natural disasters. And, you know, sometimes it takes, you know, months and years um, to be reimbursed from the federal government once that takes place. So we need to be prepared as a state to deal with that. And that all means having a sound financial footing. Um, you know, as you look at the rest of, you know, the rest of the country compared to Florida before the pandemic, there's really no one you can compare um, who comes into this pandemic, you know, with billions of dollars in reserves, AAA bond rating, you know, ranked number one in the nation by U.S. News Report, World Report and our state university system, number one by Mercatus in investment in transportation and infrastructure, top five, now I think top four, top three by Education Week and K-12 student achievement. I mean, you go down the list, and, I, and I'm often fond of saying that, you know, if Florida were a stock, you know, it wouldn't be good, it'd be great. You know, everyone would have wanted to have it and everyone would have wanted to have it early. And as Joe mentioned, a lot of that is buoyed by, you know, our traffic, um, both inside the state and from, you know, outside the state and from, and from other countries throughout the world who, you know, use Florida as a destination uh, to come to. But I think as you look back at our, at our history, when I was a kid, my parents were, were smart and moved down here and I was two or three years old, um, you know, from, from upstate New York. Um, but for the most part, for most families, uh, for most people, you know, you know, Florida was a place where people came, you know, at the end of a, a life well lived, you know, the carrot at the end of my retirement or the beginning of my retirement is going to be, I'm going to move to Florida. Um, that's no longer the case, you know, 25 and 30 years later. Now, you know, pre-COVID, we were having 1,200 Floridians move here every single day um, from throughout the country. What put that on hyperdrive was tax reform. You know, I had talked to a lot of people in other states, you know, successful business owners, and I said, you know, you, you live in a high tax state. Um, you know, you, you live in a state that has, you know, you know, onerous business regulations that make it, you know, difficult for you to engage in the marketplace. What is keeping you here? And, and they all kind of said the same thing. And they said, look, the hair that's going to break the camel's back is when Florida and other low tax states that don't have a state income tax stop subsidizing the rest of the nation. Because the reality is, while New York and Massachusetts and Vermont and California had a state income tax, their residents were able to write off that state income tax on their federal taxes. So me and Jack and Joe and, and, and Dennis and Christine and everybody else on the call were subsidizing these high tax states um, throughout the rest of the country. Now tax reform passes. And now you're seeing you know, businesses that, you know, that were on the, on the brink of leaving, fleeing to, to states like Florida. And really, we only have a few competitors. I mean, to, to a lesser extent, we compete with Arizona. To a greater extent, we compete with Texas. Um, but for the most part, you know, we're in a league of our own because not only do we have that low tax, you know, climate, not only are we ranked, you know, in the top five year after year by Forbes magazine for our business climate, um, but we also have our beautiful beaches. You know, people want to come to Fort Lauderdale. People want to come to Clearwater and, and Miami. So, you know, we had that great advantage, such a healthy state, people moving here and voting with their feet. You know, people, uh, I was asked by a reporter towards the end of last session, you know, all of you conservative Republicans are, you know, governing, you talk about fiscal conservatism, and yet, you know, the budget grows every year, gets bigger every year. I said, well, yes, and yet we haven't raised a dollar of taxes. The reason the budget gets bigger is because people vote with their feet, and they want to move to Florida. So we're getting more people, more population, more businesses, more people driving, more people paying sales tax. So, you know, that, that has really been the key to our success. And as we, so we, as we enter the, the, the COVID environment, I think it's important to note that you know, we come into it in a stronger, greater position than the vast majority of uh, certainly our Northeastern states, um, but most other states in the country. As we got into COVID, 
Um, obviously, not a lot of us knew what to expect. We'd have to go back, you know, 100 years to the, the, the pandemic of 1918 to really have any kind of barometer as to what to expect. Um, so you had the, the shutdowns to, to allow kind of the capacity to, to build up, to allow, you know, the state to, to get face masks and, and prepared for, you know, what potentially could come. And as we got, you know, through some of that period of time and got back to reopening the economy, what does that look like? How do we do it? How do we do it responsibly? And I think the, the mission there was to try to be as candid and open and transparent as to what we knew and what we didn't know. And the reality is, and I've talked to the foremost experts in the world on this pandemic from, from John Hopkins in Baltimore, and the reality is, you know, we may be five years down the line before we, we know, you know, really what's going on. Um, with the virus, you know, and, and how it and how it operates. So um, a lot of it was operating, um, you know, with the the best information that we had at the time, including and how we reopened and reengaged uh, the economy. And I think in the in the months to come, uh, obviously, as you can imagine, we've had a significant drop off. And I've already saw the first question in the queue, which makes sense. You know, what's this going to do to the state budget? What's the state look like during off you know, all of this? Um, you know, the the first time I knew we were going to have a problem was in session. Um, we just hadn't, and we weren't anywhere near shutdowns yet. My father-in-law, who owns a gas station and a mechanic shop in, in Central Florida, called me and said, "People aren't driving. They're not driving. They're not coming to get gas." And I kind of thought, "Well, I, mean, I think he's being a little probably dramatic." Truth is, that was the first number we saw an indicator on was the drop off in the gas tax. So people were already modifying their their typical driving behavior, you know, long before. You know, we got to the point of, you know, Disney closing down and Universal closing down and then, you know, mandated shutdowns and stay at home orders. Um, we were seeing, seeing that happen. And then, of course, you know, the sales tax came into play um, and the, the significant drop offs. So, you know, we've had a, a obviously a massive financial hit to the state, not unlike the businesses um, who've been interrupted or closed during this period of time in, in COVID, uh, which is going to create a significant challenge for us. You know, as we look at you know, what's available. We've spent down a lot of our, you know, our reserves, which were very healthy prior to the pandemic. We did get the CARES money, which is currently sitting uh, in the state treasury. It's a little unclear at this point as to whether or not we're going to receive the flexibility from the federal government that we'd like to see in order for us to be a little bit more nimble and agile. Uh, candidly, you know, we think based on how we've performed financially and were before the, the pandemic, um, you know, that the federal government can actually say, I actually trust Florida. Um, to make those sort of financial decisions uh, for ourselves, considering considering our track record, um, but no matter what happens, you know, even with the CARES money, even with being getting great flexibility with the CARES money, um, the the impact on the budget is going to be severe. And the only way to kind of weather that storm and get the state back on its feet is going to is going to mean you know significant cuts to the budget in order to to, to balance our budget um, and to really plan for the future. And and what I caution people is. You know, one of the reasons I think that that Florida came into this so healthy is because in really bad years, you know, in 07 and 08, and then, you know, in 2010, when, you know, when times were really hard, um, you know, the, the legislature, I think particularly the Florida House, took the position of we're going to, we're not going to think about the next six months, you know, what does this look like in, in three months or six months, but what does this look like in five years and 10 years? How do we get the state, you know, back on our feet, even though we're going to be long gone and people will have forgotten us by then? Um, what's in the best interest of the long-term health of the state? And, and what that means is, you know, when it looks at, you know, borrowing money because you're bonding or something like that, you do that for things you need, not for things you want. Um, that's really tough. Uh, as, you, as you know, Jack, I mean, a group of politicians, um, you know, there's a lot of wants and a lot of needs in the community. And there's a lot of good programs and valuable programs. But the most important thing that we can do during this period of time is, is navigate this ship appropriately. Um, we've been given a great inheritance in the, that is Florida, both in our business community and our environment. And, you know, in order to be true good stewards of that, you know, we've got to get the state back up and firing. I, I do truly believe that because we're coming into this so strong, um, because of our low regulations for businesses, um, that we are gonna allow to get on our feet even quicker. And as Joe mentioned about the importance of, of tourism in the state, um, the other thing that we've got going for us, I think is when the, when the cloud lifts, whether that's in the form of a vaccine or cases going down, whatever it is, you know, I think the person living in Michigan doesn't come out of this and say, well, gosh, you know, I'm gonna go to Massachusetts for vacation, right? They were gonna come to Florida. They're gonna go to Fort Lauderdale. They're gonna go to Clearwater. They're gonna go to Miami. They're gonna go to Panama City. You know, they're gonna to wanna to come and enjoy, you know, where we live uh, for their vacation, which of course is gonna help our recovery as well. So, you know, we got an eye on that. We know that, that how important that is to, to, for, to get us back on our feet. And in the next several months, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna do what we need to do to steer the ship through this storm 
uh, and get us get get your your members and the business owners and the executives and the line employees back to doing what they do best, which is fully engaging in the in the marketplace. Well, thank you, Speaker. Let me uh, let me just start with one question. I, I have um, I had the great opportunity to serve with some outstanding speakers. Uh, Tom Feeney was my first speaker. I, I had Alan Bentz, uh, one of the finest gentlemen I've ever served with, and Marco Rubio was the last speaker I got to serve under. Uh, can you tell me what speakers have reached out to you to prepare you for this coming session and, and the role they play in being an advisor or a mentor to you at this stage? No, I, I appreciate that. You know, I've, I've, I've reached out to them, um, you know, because it's, uh, it's valuable advice. You know, Speaker Cannon, who obviously went through a very difficult time financially for the state, has been a, you know, has been a great help in, in how they navigated that. And I think that, you know, seeing those opportunities to, to improve the state during this difficult time. As you mentioned, Speaker Rubio had gone through a very difficult time. Um, you know, the one thing I think is, is if you go back and whether it's, you know, Speaker Cannon's time or, or Senator Rubio when he was Speaker, you know, whoever it is, when you see those difficult moments for the state, you, you have missed a very important plot point um, if, if you don't realize that with, with the challenges that we face, we also have significant opportunity. Um, you know, people, uh, you know, people don't want to rock the boat when things are good. People don't want to rock the boat during rich budget years. People don't want to rock the boat when nobody's clamoring or yelling at them. Um, but when you come up and you're facing the challenges that our families are facing, that our business is facing, that our state is facing, it's not a question of, of rocking the boat. It's a question of, of, of survival and opportunities to, to excel, be bold, be innovative. Um, I read while we were at home during the stay-at-home orders that, that Isaac Newton came up with his laws of science while he was in quarantine for a year. You know, I think that there's a lot that happens when your back's against the wall and you got time to think. And during this period of time, we shouldn't lose the fact that, you know, the marketplace has been innovating while, while all of this is happening, whether that's in the private market whose, whose businesses have adapted in an effort to try to survive, or whether it's in the, the public space like K-12 education where you know, six months ago, eight months ago, you know, digital learning was something people talked about, but didn't really have to deliver on a mass scale. Now, teachers who may have never used you know, digital devices or, or digital learning way to deliver content have now been forced to do so. And therefore, we have tens of thousands of now experts across the, the, the state in how to provide supplemental digital content you know, to kids. So you know, we, we have got a lot of innovation through this, a lot of bold opportunity. Um, you know, we, we have to make the tough decision. This is where leadership matters. So as a result of all of that, although the challenges are great, the opportunities are even greater. Thank you. Uh, first question, I think you saw it come in, but maybe I, I think you touched on it, but maybe you could expand on it. Um, the impact so far since the 7 one the July 1, 2020 state budget versus the revenue projections, I guess I'll ask that in two parts. One, when is the next revenue estimating conference to give you all a little guidance on that? And then what do you expect in percentage wise in terms of the hit? Yeah, we're, we're a little ways away from the budget estimating conference, but you know, even more importantly, Jack, as you know, I mean, sometimes that can change pretty radically, um, particularly in this very volatile environment that, you know, that we're in. So I, you know, I, I don't want to put too much stock in any particular rest, revenue estimating conference. I think the trend is what's most, most important. Um, I think the trend financially started to obviously tick up a little bit for the state. I think we, uh, you know, we we're, were just really in the black last month. I mean, when I say in the black, I mean, you know, like $2 million in the black. I mean, which, you know, for a state of $92 billion budget is nothing. It's toothpicks. Um, but, but it's in the black. So we're trending in the right direction. Obviously, we hope that there's not a, an event, whether that's, you know, additional cases or a surge of any kind that creates any sort of dis disruption to that upward, uh, upward trajectory for the state. Um, but as I mentioned before, you know, the budget cuts are still going to be significant. And people say, well, what about the CARES money? Doesn't that, doesn't that do it for you? The reality is, you know, that's, that's non-recurring money that can't be used for a recurring purpose, right? So if I hired somebody, um, I suspect that I'm going to hire them. I'm going to keep them next year. That's a recurring expense. Um, you know, that's not really what that money is for. You know, that money should be thought of as a really expensive Band-Aid um, to get us through to do what we have to do. Um, but it's not a, a, a budget, you know, supplement that's going to be available the year after. 
and it's going to take some time for our economy to recover. I mean, there's going to be, you know, uh, businesses and restaurants that unfortunately never open their doors again uh, here in Florida, and that's going to take a toll on the economy. So there's probably, unfortunately, more unanswered questions at this point than there are answered questions. Um, you know, all we can do is continue to look at the trend and I think, you know, really be responsible as we get into the legislative session and making sure that we're being good stewards of the money, making sure that we're backfilling our reserves because we, call, we also can't afford to now be a state that doesn't have a AAA bond rating because that's going to exponentially get harder for every successive generation in the legislature. And I, I for one, don't want to leave, you know, my kids or, or our families in a situation where they're, you know, they're worse off five years from now. I'd rather make the tough choices up front and get the state back to, to roaring, which is what we, what we plan to do. Thank you, Speaker. Let me, uh, we've got, a, I've got five questions in the queue here. I know some are coming in. Uh, one of the questions was Amendment 2, if passed, would make Florida the first state to have a $15 an hour minimum wage in a state constitution. Uh, your thoughts on that? And as you travel the state and speak with the employers and the employees, uh, how do you think that's being received? I can't speak for them. I'll, I'll say I'll start with me. I, I think it's a total job killer uh, for people in Florida. It, you know, we, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can look at people who've done this. You can look at Seattle um, and see the impact that it's had on, you know, on a lot of industries. But take the service industry, for example, which, as Joe mentioned before, you know, part of being a tourism destination is, you know, we, we have a significant service industry that services people who are traveling in the state or, you know, you know uh, national and international visitors. You, you see the devastating toll that has taken in the service industry in Seattle, where, you know, at first, you know, people move the, you know, the tips, you know, they got rid of tips for, for, you know, a waiter or waitress, and they move it to a bill. Okay, well, now there's a gratuity line in the bill. But guess what? Now that waiter or waitress is making less money than they were prior to the enactment of the minimum wage. And then, of course, that's, that's assuming that they're, they're one of the lucky ones that actually gets to keep their job. Because as you know, the businesses are going to maintain a certain margin of profit in order to be able to operate, pay their employees, put money away for a rainy day, expand. And if that means that they're going to have to cut back on, on staff, they're going to cut back on staff. And, you know, so the, the economics of this are, 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 are pretty simple. Um, you know, interestingly enough, there was, a, I think it was like the World Health Organization had come out a couple years ago and said, hey, if you want to get people to drink less soda, you know, put a 20% tax on soda. Because they did a study that said if you do a 20% tax on soda, then you, there'll be a 20% corresponding reduction in the consumption of soda. Now, I don't know if that's true. But what I would say is, if it is true, well, what happens if we raise the minimum wage, right? There's a corresponding and correlating decrease in the amount of people who are available in the workforce. Um, so it, it is a job killer for people. Um, I think it's terribly inhumane, the economic impact that they're going to have on families who are trying to make en ends meet. Because the, at the end of the day, they're either going to end up like those waiters and waitresses in Seattle, where they're making less money, or they're going to end up like the individuals who unfortunately lost their jobs because businesses had to cut back. So, you know, I, I tell people to be very cautious. Um, you know, all of us are in the same boat when it comes to caring about, you know, the employees who are working in our state, who are working hard to, to, to live a life of purpose, to provide for their families, to build a future for their families, for wanting their kids to have more than that they had. We're all in the same boat on that. Um, and, and while it seems extremely compassionate to say, I want someone to make more money, we all want that. We all want that. But we want it to be in a fully functioning marketplace so that that person is truly moving up and doesn't, and doesn't you know, because of a constitutional amendment, end up losing that path pathway to prosperity. Thank you. Speaker, uh, question, next one. You heard when we mentioned at the start about the affordable housing Sadowski Trust Fund. Yeah. Uh, your thoughts on the likelihood it will be fully funded during this upcoming session with the budget shortfalls that we've already touched on and then having that hurricane hit the state and the panhandle just just this week yeah obviously that, that's a challenge right i mean the you know being able to to do what we need to do um you know with, without getting into every access to money and, and and jack as you know kind of philosophically from from my perspective it's always been my belief that you know, uh, whether it's in local government, a lot of times, as you know, local government has pots of money that there's lots of strings attached. You can only use it for this purpose, not for that purpose. You know, it's my belief that people, you know, we elect our leaders to prioritize what is most important for the state at a particular time and then be accountable for the selection of those priorities. Um, I'm happy to stand before before you all or before voters back home and say, hey, this is this is why we made this choice and not this choice. Um, so that means everything has to be on the table. We have to plan what's what's in the best interest of the state. 
um, you know, in the, in the long term. Um, next question that came in, is there support in the Florida House to prioritize funding for alternative transportation projects, such as commuter rail next session, as it did this past year with new road construction? So I guess your thoughts on whether this coming session or your second session as speaker, uh, will we see some transportation projects along the lines of commuter rail? Well, I, I certainly am a believer in, you know, investments in infrastructure, because uh, I think it, it certainly, number one, it creates jobs. Number two, it benefits all people. I, I haven't historically been a huge fan of rail because I've seen it across the, across the country kind of been a black hole of, black hole of cash, um, where it doesn't get the ridership that people expected or wanted, um, where it hasn't been successful. I think where you look at things like Brightline, where the private marketplace has said, hey, I think I can make some, some money here, whether it's on ridership or on real estate along the, along the tracks, I think that's the appropriate place for, you know, for the marketplace to step in and, and make those kinds of projects. What I wouldn't want to do for us is, is engage in an in a, in a environment where, um, you know, we put lots and lots of money and we don't get the outcome. If you look at Orlando, you know, the train in, in and around the SunRail, um, you know, they, they came out with something not, while, not, not long ago, Jack, that said it would actually be cheaper to run the SunRail if they just let everyone run it, you know, ride it for free. Uh, because it doesn't make a revenue and they spend more money, you know, cutting tickets and doing all those kinds of things and they actually make on, on the train itself. So, you know, we don't want to get into a situation where, you know, we make the wrong decision and then it, you know, we really, there's no way to get out of it. Um, so I, I do think that transportation is wildly important for us. I think we also have to be thinking about, you know, what, what is transportation going to look like in, in 25 years? I think it's going to look a lot different than it does today. You're already seeing people who are constructing parking garages with a plan to convert those parking garages, um, you know, to office space or to other usable space because they realize, you know, 25 years from now, you know, they might not be able to fill that parking garage, um, you know, like they can today. So I think being, you know, being forward thinking and forward leaning about how we look at things like electric vehicles and, you know, rapid bus transit and, you know, the private marketplace and bright line. I think all of that is important. I also think it's important that we look at how the, 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 the state's transportation infrastructure is, is situated throughout the state. So, for example, where I'm sitting today in Tampa Bay, you know, we have, you know, some significantly sized counties in, in Hillsborough, Pinellas County, Pasco County, all have separate metropolitan planning organizations. I think it's been clear from the federal government for some time that if we expect to be, you know, get our fair share of the taxes that we are sending to the federal government on transportation, that we probably need to consolidate some of those planning organizations to have, you know, a Tampa Bay oriented metropolitan planning organization as a way to make sure we're pulling down our fair share of federal funds. So I think those are the things that we should be looking at on the transportation and infrastructure front. Okay, and, and Speaker, I've got a bunch of questions from uh, Chip Lamarca about his committee assignments. I'm going to skip those. <laughs> Uh, but I think, you know, Chip has uh, been a great friend of all three of our chambers in the South Florida Business Council, a huge supporter of our issues. But uh, Chip, those questions are gone. Uh, next up is a question about higher education. We had a great webinar earlier this summer yeah. uh, with the head of the state uh, board of the higher education. And at that time, we were talking about the impact of the coronavirus on uh, funding and on uh, the campuses. And my question to you is, Will COVID-19's impact, uh, well, how would that be felt now that we're looking at campus attendance versus remote learning? And yeah. do you see, how do you see that playing out, Mr. Speaker? Yeah, look, I, I, I am telling everybody, you know, expect cuts. You know, you have to go into it expecting cuts. Um, you know, higher ed would be no exception to that. You know, we're proud of the fact that, you know, Sid Kitson and the BOG and the leadership of our state universities have been able to put us in a situation where, you know, we're ranked number one, you know, in the, in the nation um, by, by U.S. News and World Report for offering higher education in our state. We also offer it affordably, um, you know, but the reality is we're going to go through some tough years. So I've told people, what is it that you need? What are the basic necessities you need to keep, you know, to keep us going, to educate our kids? You know, now is not the time to ask for the things that we want, you know, the, the, the large luxurious buildings, you know, paid for by the taxpayer. That, that's not on the table. Um, when we're talking about, you know, the fact that businesses aren't able to provide for their families or, or people are out of work, um, you know, we really need to, to have our, our actions and our behavior mirror that. So, you know, we obviously want to make sure that whether it's in the, the pre-K space through K through 12 or into higher education, that we continue to offer, you know, world-class education, you know, throughout that, throughout that, uh, that, that, that 
pathway. Um, but we also need to be cognizant of, you know, we need to look, you know, be, uh, be realizing that in three or four years, you know, we're going to need to, you know, to be back to where we were, but in the, in the very short term in the next year or two, you know, that's probably going to be difficult. And I, I should have mentioned, uh, Dr. Rosenberg from FIU actually is on our South Florida Business Council and chairs our education um, area in terms of, of that. Uh, I've got a couple questions coming in. Let me just go to one question about the state has issued contracts to elder care facilities for COVID treatment centers. And some of those nursing homes have long histories of deficiencies in dealing with infectious diseases. And, uh, and, and of course, as it indicates, I'm now seeing these diseases spread in, in even deaths. Uh, they mentioned one here locally, as they say, one in Palm Harbor. Is there anything that the legislature can do to better hold nursing homes responsible as we move out of this COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, I'm not sure what they mean by hold them responsible. I mean, I, I think that in, lar for lar in large part, and there may be some, obviously, there's always outliers to this. Uh, in large part, I would commend, you know, our nursing homes facilities throughout the state and, and their staff. You know, they really were the tip of the spear on this. I mean, um, throughout the state, even in areas like South Florida, where, you know, there was more cases, you know, there's, there's high density of cases, certainly high density of fatalities, you know, in, in those types of, of populations where you're seeing older, you know, older adults in those kinds of facilities. Um, so, you know, I think the governor's, you know, first priority was making sure that, you know, we were getting them the resources, the testing, the, the Department of Health strike teams that they needed in order to take care of their, you know, their patients and their employees. So, you know, I think, I think by and large, um, they did a really, really good job of doing that. I think the state, the Surgeon General, you know, Riv Keys made it a priority. I know in my area, I was in contact with the governor's office several times on, you know, facilities who had had cases to make sure that everyone was being tested, to make sure that there wasn't an outbreak. Because as you know, as you saw in other states, you know, once there was an outbreak in a facility, it became very difficult, you know, to, to rein that back in. So I think they've done a really, really strong job and, and, and kind of would, would commend them for doing that. You know, on, on the CARES money, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of the CARES money is, you know, sitting there. I think what they're probably seeing in the way of funds that are being dispersed are actually money from reserve that's being spent by the Department of Emergency Management, hopefully with the idea of, of being able to backfill a lot of those COVID-related expenses, you know, from, from the CARES money. Uh, before I go back to a substantive question, just kind of a uh, question the, about the process up there. Over the years, there's been times when the Speaker of the House and the Senate President haven't had a strong relationship, sometimes a rocky relationship. Other times, they've been uh, very close and working in sync. My understanding is from all the people we've communicated with, you and uh, the incoming Senate President uh, have a great working relationship and actually come from the same region. Do you care to comment on that? I do, uh, you know, well, well, Senator Simpson's, you know, Senate President Designate Simpson is a friend. Um, we spoke, you know, an hour ago. Uh, we, we penned an op-ed in the Tampa Bay Times together the other day. Uh, you know, we're great friends. And, and look, Jack, as you know, being up in the legislature, you know, I guess some years, you know, the, the Senate's the enemy or the House is the enemy. Uh, look, we, we have a common enemy as Floridians and, and that enemy is, is this pandemic and in a situation that has put our families and our businesses. So I think we're locked in on that enemy and that enemy alone. Great. Let me ask you about Florida's tourism industry. Obviously a huge concern of the South Florida area. Um, we were having record years in tourism for a number of years, as you know. Um, first of all, how long do you think it'll take for it to fully bounce back? What are you hearing from the experts? And then secondly, um, will you support house efforts to increase advertising dollars for tourism to help with that recovery? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I, I think increasing dollars for anything gets tough. I mean, uh, I think that certainly realizing that, you know, things like Visit Florida play a significant role in making sure that people realize that Florida is open for business, that our hotels and our beaches are open for business, both, both internally of the state and, and externally. Um, and I also think when the time comes when, you know, they can, they can make the, the message of the good news of, of what is Florida, as you know, even when our cases will, you know, drop down to, to near nothing, there might still be a perception in other places that you know Florida has a lot of cases. So you know we're going to need organizations like you know like Visit Florida um, to make sure that they're educating the public that hey it's safe to come to Florida and and, and spend money. Um, so so I think that's a huge priority. You know I, I think that I, I've had some encouraging news lately in speaking to some of the hoteliers who are starting to see an uptick. Now in fairness, Jack, those aren't the ones I think from from Miami, from you know from Broward, from Palm Beach. I think that's a, a more of a difficult situation. That, 
that they're in. But I think as you move further north in the state, you know, whether that's on the I-4 corridor or as you get into the Panhandle, um, I, I obviously live on the I-4 corridor, so I speak to those hoteliers a great deal. I just came from the Panhandle where I met with several of them, and they're really starting to see an uptick in um, in occupancy. A couple of the hotels that I was at, you know, in the Panama City area, were at 85%, um, you know, occupancy and, and really getting, you know, getting full, you know, here in the near future. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that, that that's going to happen. What we're also seeing from the hotel years, they're saying they're seeing a lot of in-state travel. <clears throat> you know, people who may have, you know, vacationed out of state, uh, but are Floridians who are saying, hey, listen, we need to go away, uh, but we don't want to leave the state. So let's, you know, let's go to Clearwater Beach. I live, uh, you know, I live 15 minutes from Clearwater Beach and usually about twice a year, my wife and I go spend, you know, spend some time on the beach in a hotel, uh, you know, 15 minutes from our house. It has the added benefit of, of both being beautiful, uh, but also being close to our kids in case we need to run home because they've, you know, the two boys and they beat each other up or something. So, you know, we've got that going for us. Um, I think a lot of Floridians realize that, you know, we live where people vacation and, uh, and they're taking advantage of that. Speaking of children, one of the questions that came in was about early learning programs, which are mostly, you know, small family owned and operated small businesses. A lot of them have remained open, but are bleeding financially. Yeah. Uh, while they have been able to provide relief grants with CARES Act uh, funds and some received some PPP loans, uh, mm -hmm. they need to survive because they play a vital role in the recovery. Employees need early learning programs for their children so they can get to work. Any Thanks. thoughts on how the legislature may be able to help this vital industry? And that's from Avilio Torres from the Early Learning Coalition of Miami-Dade. No, I appreciate that. You know, the first thing I would do is give credit to Governor DeSantis, who, who never, you know, officially closed, you know, uh, daycare centers and things like that, um, which I think was, uh, was the right thing to do. It allowed, you know, families to go to work. There's also organizations, you know, where I'm from in, in the YMCA of the Sun Coast and in the YMCA in Tampa Bay, they were giving out free child care for, you know, for first responders you know, with really no ability to get, you know, reimbursed uh, from, from the state or the federal government on that, but realized that, you know, we needed our cops and our nurses and our firefighters, you know, to be going to work and they need to provide some relief. Um, you know, Jack, I, I've got a, a four-year-old boy and a five-year-old boy. So I got a kindergartner and, uh, and one in the threes class and those four. Um, and, uh, you know, during the, the first part of this pandemic, during the shutdown, uh, you know, we, uh, the schools kind of went out um, the, the three-year-old class, they closed as well. And my wife and I were in a situation, I, you know, I, my kids called it daddy preschool, but I ran daddy preschool from, you know, 7.30 in the morning to about noon. And then my wife would come home and take over and I would start working, you know, the rest of the day. Um, so it's really been a unique a challenge, I think, for families and these, you know, these early learning um, institutions, VPK, daycare, all of those things have played a vital role. I also think if you've never taught preschool, even to your own kids, uh, you realize quite, you know, how challenging it is um, to get two kids to do things, let alone, you know, a classroom full of kids. So it's a challenge. But I think even more importantly, Jack, than just the, hey, you know, kids need to be somewhere while their parents are at work. You know, if you look at our reading gains and literacy in the state, you know, VPK and early learning plays a critical role in making sure that our kids can read at grade level. And here's what we know. Here's a fact um, that 88% of, of third graders that don't read at grade level, don't graduate from high school. 88% of third graders don't read at grade level, don't graduate from high school. I mean, that is a staggering statistic that if we have a fourth grader who's not reading at grade level, that there's an 88% chance that they're gonna, not going to make it to, to wearing a cap and gown, you know, in their senior year of high school. So, you know, we know that the challenge is early and that if we can overcome that challenge early and making sure that kids are reading, um, it's a huge deal. And I, I saw a, a, a a ridiculously terrible statistic the other day, and I, but I, and I want to say somewhere north of 60% of kids don't have a book in their home, you know, don't have a book in their home. Um, so and there's a significant percentage of children who don't even have access to a book in their house, um, let alone, I mean, how can we expect them to, to not read, to, to read on grade level, you know, by third or fourth grade. So, you know, they play a vital role, certainly as we, as we go through what are the priorities for making sure that our, that our state gets back on our feet. One of those priorities has to be preparing our next generation of kids, you know, for the workforce. And in order to do that, I need them to graduate from high school. In order for them to graduate from high school, I need to, I need to know that in their VPK years and in their early elementary years, you know, that they learn to read. Speaker, we got time for two more questions. Hopefully you can stay with us for about another five minutes. I know you've been very generous with your time. Uh, the first question came in, you mentioned your op-ed on sea level rise. The question is, uh, what are your thoughts on sea level rise, resiliency, 
And what can you expect or what can we expect to see from the Florida legislature on that issue? Yeah, I think one of the, you know, one of the, the, the points I made back last year, my designation speech, and I think Senator Simpson and I, although not calling it out directly, tried to make, you know, in the, in the op-ed is there's hyper politicization around any kind of, any kind of conversation around the environment. And as a result of that politicization, we don't do common sense things. In my designation speech, I said, look, you know, flooding in our communities is something we see with our own two eyes. And we all have an interest in making sure that we're protecting our communities from flooding, protecting our communities from storm surge. You know, as you look nationally at, you know, places that are at risk uh, for devastation from storm surge, you know, at the top of that list, you're going to find, you know, Tampa Bay. At the top of that list, you're going to find Miami. You know, you're going to find areas of South Florida. So, you know, this has obviously a significant impact on us not wanting to look like Houston after you know, their hurricane or New Orleans or Galveston in 1900. And in order to do that, we have to have a plan as to how we're gonna deal with flooding, how we're gonna deal and prevent um, you know, from storm surge, you know, similar to how the Netherlands has dealt with you know, their infrastructure upgrades as a way to prevent that kind of thing. Um, but I think this, this, has, so this has practical implications. The practical implications of obviously none of us wanna open our doors and, and you know, be up to our waist in, in ocean, that's one, but it also, you know, you've already seen um, reinsurance uh, companies raise rates significantly because of the risks uh, in Florida of storm surge. As a result of that, our homeowners insurance has raised their rates to make up the, the cost differential. So you're going to see a significant impact in the next several years, um, not just because of this reason, but certainly a contributing factor is that now we are being ranked as a higher risk uh, for storm, storm surge. So one of the things that we had put in the budget that, you know, the governor, uh, the governor had to veto, which, you know, I, I encouraged him to have robust vetoes in order for us to financially be in a good situation. But one of them was purchasing the data that the, the private marketplace has on where are the priority spots, you know, if we're have a rise to a greater extent in an area of Tampa Bay or Miami, we need to be able to prioritize those spots accurately and effectively. When we model, you know, traffic corridors, you know, we can all pull up a Waze app on our phone and it'll have the red, you know, where it's like, oh, there's traffic congestion. We can easily map those things. What we can't easily map as a state as to where are the risks for, for storm surge and for flooding, we need to be able to accurately do that so that we can make the plan and, and, and execute it similarly to how we do in the, in the DOT work plan. So I, I think that's the common sense solution. Rather than getting bogged down in political nonsense, Let's get to work, get the information we need, and then plan for our state's future. Last question. Uh, obviously, you, you were a trial lawyer in terms of being in the state attorney's office, and I know your firm does a lot of business litigation, as well as probably many of the people that have joined this call. The court system has been severely disrupted by COVID-19. Um, obviously, the budget's going to look very different. But it seems like some areas, they may be saving money. Other areas, they may be spending more money in terms of whether it be security or, or you know, health concerns. Uh, have you met with the Florida Supreme Court's uh, people in terms of their priorities moving forward? And what's your forecast on what the legal system is going to look like over the next year, year to two years with COVID-19's impact? Yeah, it's a hard puzzle to solve. I mean, one of the, one of the folks who have it the worst are the clerks, the clerk of the courts. I mean, you know, uh, years ago, they, you know, they came up with the funding, the funding mechanism for, you know, the justice system. And they said, well, we're going to pay it out of court costs. We're going to pay it out of fees. We're going to pay it out of traffic ticket, those things. Well, guess what's happening in a pandemic? You know, nobody's getting pulled over because they're not driving. Nobody's going into court and pleading out a case and, and paying court costs because there's, there's no court. Uh, certainly there's no mass, you know, pleas in criminal cases or settlements in some cases. Um, so, you know, how we funded the court system has been a problem for a number of years. Um, this is obviously taking it to, to a critical juncture. So there's a lot of, the, the policy is kind of easy, you know, I mean, people talk about reforms to driving while license suspended and things like that for child support or what have you. The policy solutions might be easy. The real hard part is figuring out, you know, how do we, how do we deal with this from a budget standpoint? Um, so, you know, I'm in conversations with the core, with the clerks on, you know, what are both the short and long-term solutions for them because uh, it's a real challenge. Well, Speaker, uh, just on behalf of the South Florida Business Council, our three Chamber of Commerce Thank you for taking the time on this Thursday afternoon to share your thoughts and insights. Uh, I think uh, our members love hearing from you, get a chance to, many of them, to see you for the first time. So uh, we hope you spend time here in South Florida. Write an op-ed for our papers down here at any time. We'd love to see it, read it. But on behalf of the 
Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce, the Chamber of Commerce in the Palm Beaches, Greater Fort Lauderdale Chamber of Commerce, South Florida Business Council. I'm going to let you go and we'll wrap up from here. So thank you, Speaker. Thanks very much. Yeah, really appreciate it. Folks, thank Thanks. you for joining us today. As I've mentioned, uh, if you want to use this with the, with, you know, please contact the Chamber. This is uh, owned by the Chamber. It's to be used by the Chamber and it's for uh, that type of use only. So again, uh, thank you all for joining us today. A special thanks for, to uh, Tony Cortese for setting up the speaker, bringing him to us live. Uh, and then also thanks again to the leadership of the South Florida Business Council. We will see you at the next webinar, probably coming up in a month to six weeks. Uh, with that, Joe, anything else we need to close out with? I think we're all set. Yeah, thank all you. Set. All right. Folks, have a wonderful Thursday. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay well. God bless. Thank you.